And please grab your Bibles and open them up to Luke chapter 2. We're returning to Luke this week, and we're at the very end of the chapter, down in verse 38. Thirty-nine, actually. We're in verse 39, and I'll be reading to the end of the chapter in Luke chapter 2. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. There will be a toddler church today, so if you want to avail yourself of that opportunity, um, it'll be over in the house. Yeah, it's not for adults, it's only for the kids. <laughs> Mass exodus, everybody goes, I want toddler church, I want toddler church. <laughs> I'll be back in a moment. <laughs> All right, so it has been four weeks um, since we last looked at the book of Luke. I had someone ask me within the last week or two, are we going back to the book of Luke? <laughs> yeah, eventually, we'll get back to the book of Luke. So here we are. Um, and four weeks ago, as we were studying the book of Luke, we saw the testimonies of Simeon and Anna, uh, the redemptive proclamations, if you would, that they gave regarding Jesus when um, Mary and Joseph took Jesus um, to the temple, but the purpose of going to the temple at that time was for Mary to be able to fulfill the purification laws at that time. We talked about that, and I'll mention it again in just a moment. But they went there 40 days after the birth of Jesus, because that was according to the law. So eight days after his birth, he was circumcised, and then 40 days after his birth, then they would go to the temple to fulfill that. Today, in our passage today, we kind of leap forward to the time when Jesus was 12 years old. And it's just, um, as we go in it, I'm going to have a, a thought that I want to share with you on that. But, um, but it's also an interesting thing, just to, again, not part of this, but it will be through it as a whole. And that is to remember the fact that Jesus was born as a human, okay? He was fully God, but he was fully man. And it's hard for us to think about the fact that God incarnate lived through all those days. He was a toddler. Did you ever wonder, did he go through his terrible twos? Did he scrape his knee? Yeah, say again. He had the terrific twos, yes. I mean, I, I just, there's a lot of times when you just think about how all this plays out, you know? And even last night, um, as Jimmy mentioned, we've got to watch the, the streaming, live stream, or not live stream, but streaming of um, the Jesus production from Sight and Sound. You know, they brought that in as well, and, you know, talking about 
uh, James and John's mom talking about when they were boys. Oh boy, the sons of thunder. Boy, did it, you know. And so, Mary, did Jesus ever give you a problem? Oh, well, let me tell you the time that Jesus gave me a problem. And I thought, yeah, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. And, anyway, and so, this is the only recorded thing that Jesus potentially did wrong, but he didn't do anything wrong. Make sense? And so, you know, she tells them about it, and they go, and that's it? <laughs> that was it? And, but you wonder, what was it like living with Jesus as a child, going through his adolescence? He was tempted in every way, such as we are, the book of Hebrews tells us. Yet he was without sin. I have to believe that as Jesus in the flesh grew, though he was sinless, we know that, yet he experienced all of the same things that we experienced. So those struggles that you've experienced, that's why we can go to him because we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched. But he, ex he knows them. He understands them. He can sympathize with us because he's been there. And so this is kind of an interesting thing for me as I just meditate on him. We don't think about that a whole lot because we get into his ministry. We have two and a half, three years of his ministry. And it's bam, 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 bam. And he's healing people and all this kind of stuff. But this gives us just a, a stopping point just to think about the fact, the humanity of Jesus, just to think about that, even from the time of his childhood and then um, into this adolescent, preteen pre moment, okay? And so, so the th question, though, as I come through this, for me, just as a passage, and that is, if people were looking for me, where would I be found? If people were looking for me, where would they find me? Okay, it's a really interesting thing. I mean, because that's because they're going to find Jesus. They're going to find him in the temple. You guys know the story. Chuck just read it. Okay, but I have to ask myself then: If you're looking for me, and you could, you know, I'm not here at the church or whatever, and you're looking for me. Where would you find me? What would I be doing? So meditate upon that. Now, we're going to talk about this from two perspectives. We're going to talk about it, first of all, from the perspective of Joseph and, and Mary, okay? Because clearly they have a perspective in this whole situation. And so the activity of, of Joseph and Mary, first of all, the thing we see and the thing we're told about is um, their adherence to the word of God. And that is that they, they uh, performed all things according to the law of the Lord. And so that goes back to, again, the message from four weeks ago, where they went to the temple in order to uh, fulfill the purification laws. But that's what we're going to see here today. Again, that as they come now to, to Passover, and they participate then in the Passover according to the law of the Lord, that they also are, in a sense, performing the things which were required them according to the law as well. And so as we see from Exodus 23, um, and you can go to Deuteronomy as well, it's on your sermon note sheet, that there was a, a command by Yahweh that all the men of Israel would appear to him before him in the temple three times a year for three specific feasts. This refers to this, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Passover. I'll come back to that in a moment, okay? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the Feast of Ingatherings, okay, which is what we refer to as Pentecost, and then the Feast of, um, I'm sorry, the Feast of Harvest, which is Pentecost, and then the Feast of Ingathering, which is Feast of Tabernacles, okay? So, um, what we're talking about today is Passover, which is for them in this one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so if you remember, okay, because at this point right now, the world is, is celebrating Easter. We're going to do that at the end of April. But the reason we're going to do that is because of this, this, not this passage, but passages like this, which give us the specific timing of when Christ would be the, the Passover lamb. So I think it's as interesting for us that as we come and we see, in a sense, the bar mitzvah, not really, but that concept for Jesus, the, the manhood, that we're reading about this happening at Passover, because Jesus himself is going to be the Passover lamb, okay? And I don't want you to miss that analogy as we come through this whole thing as well, that as he's there and he talks about being about the Father's business, that already there's this kind of preparatory stage of what is going to happen in the future. But... On, we're told in Exodus chapter 12, and you can go there later and check this out, in Exodus chapter 12, at the very inception of when 
that Passover lamb was to be offered that was during the, the Exodus, okay? And so they weren't going to select it back then on Nisan 10, but they were told by God that this was going to be a perpetual feast for them and that they would on Nisan 10, the 10th day of Nisan, or Aviv, back in that day was called Nisan, the month of Nisan was called Aviv, that on the 10th day that they would choose a perfect lamb. They would choose their lamb to be their sacrifice. And then they would take four days to examine that sacrifice in order to make sure that it was perfect, that there was no blemish within it. And then on the 14th day of Nisan, at twilight, which literally is between the evenings, okay? So that's the end of the Jewish day, because remember the Jewish day begins at sundown, and it goes to sundown, okay? So at the end of the 14th day, so the 14th day begins, okay, in the evening, and it goes down the next day, and then when you get between three and six o'clock in the afternoon, between the evenings, that's twilight, that's when this Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. Then after they sacrificed the Passover lamb, they would then roast it, okay? And so this comes back into Exodus now, okay? They would roast it, and then they would eat it at the beginning of the 15th day of Nisan. That 15th day of Nisan was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The 14th day of Nisan, when that lamb was slaughtered, that was Passover. Passover was a one-day feast combined then with a seven-day feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? And so they would be in town then for eight days. But technically, they didn't begin to them. They didn't have, if getting to Jerusalem, they didn't necessarily have to be in Jerusalem at the beginning of the 14th day. They just had to be there at the end of the 14th day in order to sacrifice the lamb. Then they were there throughout the next seven days for the Feast of unleavened bread. Is everybody tracking with me on this one? Okay. So in Luke, we read that they're there for Passover, and they were, but they were there probably for seven or eight days celebrating this whole feast of unleavened bread. And the Jewish people began to combine, merge the two Passover and unleavened bread, and refer to it as one or the other, normally as Passover. Okay. And so we see that even on the calendar today, that Passover begins here, and they rarely ever refer to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They just refer to the Feast of Passover. But really, there are two feasts that are there. And we know, just summing it all up for us as we, come, as we think about the resurrection of Christ, when Christ then rose on the first day of the week after Passover, that first day of the week after Passover, according to Leviticus 23, was the Feast of um, first fruits. And so we're told that Jesus fulfilled the Feast of first fruits by coming the first fruits of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, okay? So I kind of, real quick summary in there. So that's why they're there, okay? And so they are, they are following, they're adhering to the word of God. Again, the other thought process I have there in the introduction is, uh, as we look at this, how important, what priority does that word of God have in your life? Well, for his parents, for Mary and Joseph, okay, for Joseph and Mary, the word of God was important. Again, we say that the word of God is our sole, sole authority for faith and practice, okay? So one of the things coming into this, this year, when the, the, the timing of traditional Easter in um, Resurrection Sunday, the timing of Christ's resurrection, they conflicted. There was a, you know, there's a battle, okay? And so you're right, Phyllis, you know, it's like, thanks. I think the same thing. It's been so weird because everybody else has celebrated Easter, right? And so it's kind of a, this word confluence, like, ah, you know. But, but we say that we believe the Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice. And so what do you do when the Bible is in opposition to the culture, even if it's the church culture, okay? And so they went... They, they knew what the word was. They knew what, they were, what was required of them. And they sought to submit to that and follow that, okay? And so, again, I picture a little bit of a Hannah in this. Remember, when you go back and you read um, uh, Samuel, and, and you read about how um, that, oh, Hannah's husband's name, Elkanah. Elkanah took uh, Hannah and Peninnah um, every year to celebrate, okay? And so there's a little bit of this concept that's going on here as well, okay? So they're adherence to the word of God. But now we get into their adventure with, God's son, okay? So their adherence, their adherence to God's word, now we have the adventure with God's son. It sounds like a good um, radio drama, doesn't it? The adventures with God's son. And so 
they had it, okay? Well, the first thing we see in this adventure with God's son is they were, had a lot of presumption going on. Their presumption. They presumed, they supposed that Jesus was with them in the train, okay? In the caravan, okay? And again, you have to, to picture um, what it's like in those days. In, they didn't have their highways. They didn't have their freeways. They didn't even have avenues or lanes, not even back alleys, okay? And so um, in order to travel, um, from Nazareth to Jerusalem and then Jerusalem back to Nazareth, you would literally go from Nazareth down into the, the, the Jezreel Valley, okay, the, the Valley of Megiddo, or Megiddo, okay, anyways, and they would go down into there and they would pass over to the, the Jordan Rift Valley, okay, and they would come down along the Jordan, J Jordan River and they would come all the way down to Jericho. From Jericho, they would go up to Jerusalem, even though they were going south to Jerusalem, makes sense? They would go to Jericho, but now they're going up. When I go home to Pittsburgh, when we go to back to Mecca, and, 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 and we do our, our, our pilgrimage to Pittsburgh, we always have to go up to Pittsburgh because we come from Georgia to South Carolina, North Carolina, and the minute we go from North Carolina into Virginia, what happens? You go up oh yeah yeah and so it's, it's a beautiful beautiful seven miles in that area but you're going up and then you think okay we went up but then you hit west virginia and what do you do you go up some more so you know, two, two tunnels yeah two tunnels save us from going up even further and so that's the idea so they're going from jericho and they're traveling up okay through a ravine Okay, along the edge, it's called a wadi. So they would have the, like gullies or ravines where the water had washed it out when there's rain up in the mountains. And along the edge of those, along the ridge, they would have their roads, their walkway, okay? And so you literally would walk along this ridge going along. Now the problem, and that's where, when Jesus talks about the Good Samaritan, this is that ridge, that it happens, okay? And so if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, what what happens to the the jewish man who's traveling alone he got beat up he got he got um mugged okay using our terms right and so left for dead and so the reality is you didn't travel alone you traveled in a train in a caravan okay in order to make sure that you were protected from all the thieves who were hiding along that route because as you would go along it um there were just nooks and crannies where those those guys could they could they could be so, so that's what's, what's going on. So they, they get into this caravan. Now I'm thinking in my brain, there's nothing biblical in this for me to be able to say, this is exactly how it happened. I don't know. This is total conjecture. You have to wonder how did this happen? Moms and dads, how can it be that you will be able to leave your kids someplace? Now I can tell you three occurrences, two that I've been a part of, not my kids, somebody else's. Um, and then about uh, someone who was on a, a youth missions trip. I mean, the youth mission trip was bad because I was in Europe, right? They left their kid, they left the kid on a youth mission trip someplace and they got to the next place and realized they were missing the kid and they had to travel back a couple of hours to go <laughs> retrieve the kid because everybody thought the kid was in one van and they thought he was in the other van, right? <laughs> well, literally years ago at the previous church we were at, the day before cell phones, right? Mom left, thought dad would bring the kids home. Dad left, <laughs> thinking, Mom took the kids. He didn't see them. And all of a sudden, everybody else leaves, and we still got two kids sitting there. <laughs> no cell phones. So now you got to wait. You got to call. You got to leave a message at the house and hope that they, what, get the message, okay? And they're going to call back to the church landline because that's the only way that you have communication, okay? And so what we decided was somebody would just take the kids home and just would just leave them a message. Hey, listen, they're going to be at so-and-so's house, okay? Okay? So... Those things, what, happen even in our modern times, okay? Now, I don't know how it happened there, but I'm thinking that probably the caravan left from, it didn't leave on the outskirts, it probably left from the center of Jerusalem, maybe even near the temple. That would make sense, because that would be the central point in Jerusalem. So probably, they're there, and all, you know how long it takes, right? We're leaving at 8 o'clock, which means what? We're leaving at 10. You guys are really bad. I'm thinking 8.30. I don't want to be in your houses. 
struggle enough when we, no, I said eight, I said eight. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, 830. See, it's all a perspective. No, my military mind, my schedule oriented is like, no, we can leave at 755. That's good. 805, no, we're late. So anyways, but you know how those things go. And so say, say again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And so if we're on a vacation and I know that I don't have any schedule, I can be relaxed. But I don't want to have a, I don't want to have a lead time. I mean, I put the lead time in my brain. I'm done. So. But anyway, so you know how that plays out. So I'm thinking the caravan's all getting together and all the people are, ah, oh, we're still waiting for the slip of it. You know, where are there some of us at, you know? Ah, oh, they're always late. And so anyways, and so all this thing's going on. And so Jesus just, what is natural to him? What does he do? He goes into the temple. And while he's in the temple, the caravan leaves. Mary thinks he's hanging out with Joseph. Joseph thinks he's hanging out with Mary. And they don't find out. I want you to think about that to the end of the day. They've now traveled down that path to Jericho. Probably is where they first stopped. That's probably where they found out. They probably had a stopping point there, Jericho. Some of the oases that were down in that area, probably a, a spot where they could... Um, water the camels if there were camels and donkeys and stuff like that and they probably had a little stopping point that was there i don't know again the bible doesn't tell us okay but we're told it was <clears throat> a while later probably the end of the day when they realized they didn't have them that leads to the next point their torment literally it says that they were greatly what anxious but in the greek the word um, adana aduna of literally means to be tormented. So if you go to Luke 16, we'll look at that in a few years from now. Um, in, anyways, <laughs> verse 24 and 25, when Jesus gives the parable of the rich man, or the, the poor man, Lazarus and the rich man, you know, and the, the rich man's down in, in, in Hades. He's in a place of torment. This is the word. They're not just slightly anxious. I want you to think about this. God has given you a special task. You have one job. You lost God. That's exactly right, Ted. Could you imagine this moment? I'm going to get to the point here. In fact, I'll just throw it out there for you right now because it all kinds of come together. Complacency in the task. The word complacency or complacent literally means a feeling of contentment or self-satisfaction, especially when coupled with an unawareness of danger, trouble, or controversy. You're fat, dumb, and happy, not knowing that there's a storm of brewing and you're the one who's under attack, right? I wonder, now I, I call it a question mark, question mark, because I don't want to put this on them. I don't want to say it is. But how many times that we become complacent in our walk with Christ? We take God for granted. We take life for granted. I can't imagine what it's like living with God, the Son of God, at best, if you would, in their brains. Even if they can't understand the incarnation moment thing going on here, they know clearly he is the Son of God. She had an angelic visit. He had one in his dreams. And she certainly gave birth in a miraculous way. And they knew what happened with John. Make sense? So all the, they got this going on, but it's what? 12 years ago. I'll bring that back up again in a moment from now. 12 years ago. What? Same, all that is 12 years ago. Because he's 12. Jesus is 12. John's older than Jesus. So all those things, all those angelic visits and everything were 12 years ago. Have you ever seen, has God ever done anything like, woohoo, in your life? How long did it take you to forget it? A week. A week, yeah. Yeah, maybe hours. I, I, I wonder, sometimes in my quiet time, man, I'm getting woohoo moments in my quiet time. And then just hours later, <clears throat> I'm acting like I never had quiet time. Do you get that? So I'm thinking, I can't fault Mary and Joseph on this one, Joseph and Mary. And yet I wonder what it would have been like at this moment to realize you had one task 
and you lost the Son of God. To be fair, he was the perfect child, and they probably had other children. To be fair, he was the perfect <laughs> child, and they, they did have other children. Yes, so I forgot to bring that part up. Yes, they have other children by now. That's exactly right. Yeah, I needed to bring that part up, because that's huge, too. Because after she gave birth to Jesus, un, un, unlike the Roman theology, the, um, the reality is we know that Joseph and Mary had children, right? They had multiple children. And so, yes, they, they had more than just Jesus there, okay? And, and so they're tracking the other kids, 100%. But to realize that you've lost the Son of God is a huge problem. And so I just want to bring it up. It wasn't just they were anxious. There wasn't just a little anxiety. They were in torment. Torment. I mean, they were being tortured. They sought him for three days. They were in torment for three days. You're going to die and you're going to stand before God. And there's no redemption anymore. <laughs> because you lost the Redeemer. You heard all those prophecies. <laughs> yeah, the redemption is coming and da-da-da, we got the Messiah. No Messiah anymore, sorry. <laughs> Uh, don't you want to just go live in the wilderness? <laughs> I mean, at this moment, it's like, wow, what are we going to do? How, do? how do we even talk to God about this? And I wonder, there's a lot of wonderings for Bob in this one. Do you understand? There's, not a, there's a lot of conjecture for Bob. There's a lot of musings in this thing. You know, Mary pondered all these things in her heart. I pondered them as well. Did they pray? Did they? Did they ask the Father, where's your son? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we blew this. But we know that you know everything. Anyways, they were in torment. All right, so now we go to the activity of Jesus. That brings it all together, because they find him, right? They find him where? In the Father's house. And he asks them, why were you looking for me? Well, I mean, searching. The idea is searching. I mean, he gets why they were looking for him. I mean, that's a no-brainer. But why was it that you were having this mass search? This should have been simple for you. Why did you look for me anywhere else? We're going to talk about, didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? Didn't you know where I'd be? So I think of myself, asking this question to somebody else. Where were you expecting me to be? Do I really want the answer? Where did you think I'd be? You didn't think you'd find me in my office studying the Word of God? You didn't think you'd find me knocking on doors and telling people about the Lord? You didn't think you'd find me? Does it make sense? Where did you think you'd find me? In the living room playing Wii? On your laptop playing Civ. Do you get it? In your bed, taking another nap. <laughs> Not yet getting there. We're, we're working on that one. Where would you be found? Where would I be found? And I just think of the statement when Jesus asked it. Why, why were you seeking me? Why would you have looked any place else but here? When you came to Jerusalem, why was this not the first place that you looked? I wonder where they did look. Why? I mean, three days in order to get to the temple. I don't know. Picture of maybe three days in the tomb? I don't know. I mean, it's just a whole lot of stuff there. You know, you get the Passover three days later. There, there he's at, you know. And so just a lot of things that you can go there. Um, what do I do, though? That Jesus desired to be in the house of God. Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of Yahweh. Now, I get it. He's Yahweh, incarnate. But again, he's a man. He's in the flesh. And so I get out of this. When you know the Father, it's not a drudgery to come to his house. It's a joy. When you know the Father, it's not a drudgery to come into the house of God. Now, I get it. We're a New Testament church. This isn't the house of God. I am the house of God. You are the temple of God. I get that. 
But collectively together, I think 1 Corinthians 3 is clear on that, that Paul was talking about that collectively together as a body we are the temple of God as well. And that Hebrews chapter 10 says that we ought to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as, as, as the manner of some is, and so much more as we see what? The day approaching. Well, what's the day? Jesus' return. Why? Because Jesus said in Matthew 24 that as, the, the, as that day comes, the, the evil is going to what? It's going to abound. And the love of many is going to wax cold. So the more and closer and closer we get to the time of Christ's return, we know that evil is going to abound. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. We ought to hunger and thirst more and more and more to be with other believers in the house of God. There ought to be a great desire for us. I remember years ago, a woman who said, um, and they were getting very involved with sports. And I'm, again, I'm not going against that. You know that my boys played baseball and, and that kind of stuff. But her comment was, she found herself becoming more comfortable with the, the unbelievers on those teams than with the people at church. That's a warning sign. It's a warning sign, y'all. Now, I understand that this church and no other church is perfect. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know why I threw this church in. I mean, there's no other church that's perfect. Find this church. Anyways, no. I mean, I've talked to people who just want this, love this church. The church isn't perfect, y'all. The fact that I'm here, I know we're, not, we're imperfect. Okay? And you can say the same thing, right? The fact that I'm here, we know we're imperfect. The fact that you're here. Say again? The fact that you're here. The fact that you're here. Yeah. I mean, so, so we get, to, get, there's no perfect church. However, there is something about the gathering together of the saints to encourage you. And all I can do is tell you that more and more over the years that I've, I've seen that when people fall away, it's because they don't come to the things at the church. Not again, I, again, I'm not teaching legalism. Don't, don't go legal because I don't want that. Okay. You don't have to be here every time the doors are open and you don't have to participate in everything the church offers. That's not where I'm going with this one. However, on the other hand, anyways, however, the reality is the more things you participate and the more you're with other like-minded believers, the more you will become conformed to the image of Christ. But the more you hang out with the world, the more you're going to become conformed to the image of the world. It's just a reality, okay? So that's, we get together to, to spur one another on, to convict one another to love and good works, right? That's what Hebrews 10 talks about. And so that's the idea. So Jesus, even though he's God in the flesh, still I have to try to bring the application. What do I learn from this young man? So teenagers, talking to you. Even you older kids club guys, kids. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to hang out? See, we're not talking about an old man here. Oh, man. No, we're talking about a 12 year old, a 12 year old who wanted to go hang out at the church, who wanted to go find people that he can talk to about the Bible. Now, I know I'm, I'm bringing that into today. That's not how it plays. But take the equation coming over. That's what he wanted. Is that what you want? Where do you desire more than anything else? So the second thing was he desired to learn from the word of God. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8 says that he took upon himself flesh and he became nothing. He emptied himself and humbled himself. Okay. Well, I think I see this so much here because he was listening and asking questions for three days. He could have been what? Teaching them. Now, I think there probably was a little bit of that going on. He was probably asking the questions and is asking. He's probably steering the questions a little bit going on. OK, as well. But but he was listening. We're specifically told that he was listening and he was asking questions. There was a part that even when he, God came incarnate in the flesh, and he was growing in wisdom and stature in the sight of God and in men, okay, that he was doing it in a humble way where he's asking questions and he's learning. He didn't sit there as a know-it-all 12-year-old. I want you to think about that. How that would have played out if you got this 12-year-old who's just sitting there saying, no, you guys are wrong. How do you know? Because I wrote the book. 
Don't you know me? I'm the word of God. I'm here. I'm, you know. He didn't do all that. Could he have done it? He could have done that. Guys, I spoke and you became. If I said, you're done, you'd be done. He could have done all that because he was? He was God. No, he could have because he was God. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He was a 12 year old. He could have. That's right. And he's gone through. Yeah. Tempted in every way, such as I am. Yeah, if I was that 12 year old, I might have done that. And so you always, I always say, you should really be grateful that I wasn't Jesus. I'd have been zapping people from the cross. I mean, you want to prove that I'm God here? Watch. I'm still going to die for sins, baby, but watch this. You're gone. You're gone. Um, too late. Now you know. I'll meet you on the other side. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he wasn't that way. He was humble and he came such that the teachers were what? Astonished. They were astonished. I promise you. It's exciting for me when you have a teenager. David, you work with the victors. Is it exciting when you got a, a teenager who earnestly, heartfully wants to study God's word? It is. I mean, it's just like, wow, this is great. It's counterculture to the world. Kids of the world, it's not in their mind, I want to study the Bible. One of the things we found when God gave us a bus ministry, I never wanted a bus ministry. God gave us a bus ministry. Somebody wanted to come. We went to pick up that individual. It came through Devin's ministry from that perspective. So you know that, you know, we just had Devin here to share. And so um, there was a young man. And so he was only about 12 years old, actually, when we picked him up. He wanted to come. So we went over and picked him up. His cousins wanted to come. They lived with him. And so we said, okay, fine. So then they were friends with the neighbors, kids. And so they wanted to come. So we picked them up. Anyways, we wanted a 15 passenger van. And we had, I can't, it's being taped, so I won't tell you how many kids were in that van. Anyways, um, <laughs> all I can say is God provided, okay? And so, but one thing we noted, that when the kids got to sixth grade, they got out of elementary school and started going into middle school, we'd lose them. Because now all of a sudden, the temptations of the world were more exciting than the word of God. So it's exciting when you got a 12 year old or above who says, no, I want to learn the word of God. This is exciting. So they don't know that he's the son of God, right? They're just astonished by it. And so what's my takeaway? When you know the father, you will, as a newborn babe, desire to learn from God's word and to grow in his grace and knowledge. First Peter two, verse two and three says that um, verse. So it says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted of the grace of graciousness of God. So I, I always like to put my if before my then, right? And so verse three, verse two, then okay, I'm going to flop them. If you've tasted of the grace of God, if you've tasted of the graciousness of God, then as a newborn babe, you will desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Think about it. When you were born, no one had to teach you, convince you that you had to eat. You just did it naturally. We've had six births, seven kids, right? Marcia would say, no, that was more than six, six and a half, I'll give her, okay? And so at that moment, though, none of, the, none of the nurses had to say, go ahead, you just, Steve, when you came and you took care of the babies, the check, you didn't have to do anything like that, right? No, no teaching. They already had it down pat. In fact, one of them, I remember the, the umbilical, cord, umbilical cord, whatever that thing is, was still attached, and they brought the baby up for Marcia to hold, and then the, and the baby wants to nurse. How does this play out? Because the umbilical cord is what? where they get all their nourishment. But now all of a sudden they're out of the womb and they get the fact that they need to what? They need to eat, they want to eat, and they know the source of it. But none of my kids, Marge is like, praise the Lord, are still nursing. <laughs> <laughs> Anna's glad that she went, she's working in powder church because she would be red as a beet right now. <laughs> none of my kids are still nursing. In fact, they didn't nurse past so long, right? Because at some point they say, what? You know what? No, 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 no. You guys aren't doing this. You're eating some real stuff. I want that stuff too. And all of a sudden you put them on the Gerber stage two, unless you're doing the grinding up the spaghetti and making them look like a Gerber stage two. Anyways, and then you're going through four, you know, and all of a sudden you're giving them what? You're giving them real food. And now how many of you adults and even teenagers, how many of you are looking forward to going home and eating your Gerber stage four? <laughs> Yeah, if you're old enough, you know, yeah, maybe me. Anyways, I shouldn't make fun. I'm, I'm almost there. Anyways, so 
But you're not, you're not going to go home and eat at the mashed up food. You're going to eat a real meal. That's what you want. That's what God's word says. That as a newborn babe, you will desire the sincere milk of the word. But in Hebrews chapter 5, going into chapter 6, Paul admonishes them. He says, listen, by this time you ought to be teachers, but I've got to come back and I've got to give you milk again. By this time you ought to be eating solid food. Jesus has such a love for it. Again, you can hide behind the fact that Jesus is God. But he was true God and he was truly man. And so on the man's side, on the flesh side, he's desiring to learn from God's word. Okay? So grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, the second thing we know about, not only was he found at the Father's house, he was found at the Father's business. Found at the Father's business. His desire was to perform the Father's will. Did you not know? Did you not know? Now, I, I want you to stop and think about it. I, I, I love, again, the, um, the Jesus production last night because they showed this so well. Because it's one of these things I think about. Okay, go back to the last sub-point, okay? He's what? He's, he's learning. He's listening, and he's asking questions of who? Who's, who's, he, who's he asking questions of? Jesus. Scribes, Pharisees, teachers of the law, right? Okay, so this, this in, 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 in comes, in this moment, when this is, this is what's happening, right? In comes who? Mary and Joseph. Walking in nicely, saying, oh, I wonder if he's here. They're not walking in nice and steady like that, right? They're what? Frantic. Say again? Frantic. Frantic. They're walking in. Oh, Jesus, there you are. Oh, don't you know? What, what are you doing? And all this, this, the scribes, Pharisees, and everything else are probably thinking, I don't know where this kid's been coming from three days anyway, but now we got a clue, right? And so, so the whole thing's happening, right? And Jesus says to them, I want you to think about this now because you don't read about this, so this is conjecture from Bob's part. But put yourself in the place of the Pharisee, the scribe, the teacher of the law. You're sitting there, and you hear this, all, this situation go on. Jesus, why would you do this to us? We've been searching for you. Why were you, looking, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? Who just came in? What it looked like, yeah, his father. That's what it looks like. It looks like his mom and dad, right? Yeah. And this 12-year-old who has been astounding you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> then has this statement. Didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? He's 12 years old. That means it was just 12 years ago, just 12 years ago. Now we say... 12 years ago, but I'm 63 now. That means I was 51. I was still old, right? So just 12 years ago, okay? So these scribes, Pharisees, teachers of the laws probably are in their 40s, maybe 50s. Were they around when those wise men came from the east looking? And they had to give an answer? Were some of those guys, at least even, were they tutelage, under the tutelage of the ones who would give the answer? Did it prick their ears? Whoa. What did he just say? We're not told. But I got to believe that this was one of those moments in history where time stood still. And there are a whole lot of thoughts going on. Why did you look for me? Didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? Literally, it says the things of the father are necessary to me. The things of the Father are necessary to me. Didn't you know that? And actually, the things of my Father. So I put the, but it's the Father of mine. So the, the things of the Father of mine are necessary to me. Sorry, I missed the of mine in there. That's important. Because he's taking ownership there. And so I have to ask myself again. I don't have the little bullet thing coming up there. But I have to ask myself again. How necessary are the things of God to me? How necessary? What priority does it have in your life? What priority does the Word of God have in your life? How necessary is it to you in your life? Are you going to spend time in it every day today? Are you going to be in the presence of God? Consider the temple from that perspective. Are you going to make sure that you are literally, you say, well, I'm a church. Now, I don't get rid of, gone. Okay, that's punching a ticket. 
I'm talking about you and God, one-on-one, mano-mano, right? That you're together and, and you are praying that you're reading his word. How important is that to you? Is it something that you're going to make a priority in your life? Jesus did. And when his mom and dad came looking for him, he said, didn't you realize it? I would be about the, my father's business. This is just who it is, who I am. And then finally, their confusion. Literally, it says that they couldn't put it together. Soon iste me, soon iste me. So iste me would be like a foundation, like a, a basis, like a, a solid thing, okay? And soon is with. And they, it means they couldn't put it together. They, they, they just, it just, and I think to myself, again, it's been what? 12 years. And so it goes back to that complacency concept that why couldn't they put it together? Why, why, what, was, what was hard for them to comprehend in this one? You think this is a what? A no-brainer, but you're reading it as it was written down. They're living it. I wonder, did they get complacent with Jesus as their son? Not necessarily as the son of God who has a messianic ministry coming up. Jesus is probably in the shop with Joseph all the time. He was a carpenter or a tradesman, a craftsman, however you want to look at that. And he was learning all those things. And he grew up with the kids of Nazareth. It become very easy to become what? In my mind, complacent, just used to it. And again, I think to Bob, for Bob, how easy it has been for Bob to become complacent sometimes in my walk with the Lord. And sometimes some things happen and you sit there and you go, I can't put it all together. But I should be able to, if I've been what? Really focusing on the Lord. Again, I'm conjecturing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honest with that one, okay? And so these are just applications that, so like if you're reading Bob's devotionals in the morning as he's going through stuff, this is kind of what you're going to read, okay? I mean, it's just Bob's meditating on this stuff. How does this really apply not to my life? And so this is where I'm at with it. I just like, wow, Jesus, I mean, Joseph and Mary, they set a great example because they're doing all the right things. They're doing all the right things. But clearly somewhere there's a disconnect where religion just became same old, same old, even though they had a clear call of God in their life. What about you? I get it. But if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God's given you a clear call in your life. Part of the commission is for every one of us to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a, cart, that's, a, that's, a, that's a blanket thing. It doesn't matter whether you have a gift of evangelism or not. That's our calling. He wants us to love him with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. These are just clear-cut things, right? The third love is what? What's the third love? Love your enemies. No, that was number two. Love your neighbor as yourself. Number three is love your enemies. And pray for those who despitefully use you. That's from Matthew chapter 5. And then you will be perfect like your Father in heaven. Do you get it? I mean, I get these things. I know it. Intellect. But I have to what? Live it out of my life. And I think what God did for Joseph and Mary was give them an aha moment. I think it's what happened to Abraham when Abraham was asked to offer up Isaac on Mount Moriah. It was an aha moment. I wonder whether Abraham became more important. The blessing became more important than the blesser. And God said, no, I want you to offer your son, your only son, the one whom you love. And Abraham was forced to make the decision. The rich young ruler was forced to make the decision. He, had to, he was asked to sacrifice that which was most important to him. But he went away sad because he loved his riches more than he loved God. So I ask you, are there times of complacency that happen in your life? So in the end, where would you be found? Where would you be found? Would you be found in the word of God, amongst his people, in his presence, or would you be found just doing your thing in the world? How important is knowing and obeying the word of God to you? 
Is it a priority to you? How important is it to you to be with other believers in the house of God? And finally, then, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of the life of Jesus when he was 12. And I thank you, Lord, for the things that you can teach us through this time, Lord, and uh, the priorities that maybe we ought to have. Lord, I do pray specifically for our preteens and teens, Lord, as they, they come through and um, that they would have as a desire that they would set it in their um, in their minds right now and in their lives that you would be the priority of their life and that um, they would set that as a foundation, Lord, and that they would never change through their lives, Lord, that they would desire to magnify you. And for those of us who are older beyond those days, Lord, I know the application still draws to me, and so I pray that you would help me and the others to be committed to you at all times, Lord, that we would seek to honor you, not legalistically, not for our own pride, but Lord, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.